actually nothing particularly new to talk about Israel in terms of apartheid. You can find academic papers, you can find books on that topic going back to the 70s, the 80s. But it started to get traction in particularly the last sort of decade or so, particularly since the start of the Second Intifada, uh, and it's had some mainstream sort of um, amplification. For example, with the book by former president of the US, Jimmy Carter. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details about the nature of that book, but he, he used the word apartheid in the context of Israel. So it's going mainstream, if you can put it like that. But there is a, a common misunderstanding or a misconception that I find when it comes to this topic of Israel and apartheid. And that misconception is shared by opponents and supporters of this as an analysis. When you talk about Israel in terms of apartheid, nobody is saying that what happened in South Africa historically and what is happening in Palestine today is exactly the same. There is no idea of an exact equivalence going on. Certainly I don't mean that. Any of the people that I know that talk about Israeli apartheid do not mean that. There is a comparison to be made, and there are similarities, and there are differences, which I'm not going into now. But the main point here is that out of the context of South Africa, the idea of apartheid emerged within international legal conventions, independent of how it originated as a system in South Africa. Okay? And I'm not going to go in, I can't go through all of these examples of the laws in detail. I'll give you a list in a second. But this is a useful way of thinking about it. These are the words of John Dugard, who's a South African legal professor, and he used to serve as the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. And he wrote, and this is actually in the, uh, the forward to my book on Israeli apartheid, he wrote, it is Israel's own version of a system that has been universally condemned. That is a, a sort of pithy, succinct way to think about it. It is Israel's version of a system that has been universally condemned. Again, so I'm, these are just examples of where you can find apartheid talked about within international conventions. Note that the last one includes the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court as well. Um, oh, small caveat as I'm going through, or small point as I'm going through this. Uh, if anybody wants a copy of the PowerPoint uh, afterwards, uh, my, e my website will be on the last slide, so feel free just to use the contact form on my website, and I'm happy to send anyone the PowerPoint because there's quite a lot of information in it. I'm going to just touch on, before finishing this, op this opening comments about the, the use of the term apartheid, with reference to a report that a lot of people don't know about, but it's a very significant report, and I urge people who are interested in this issue to get this, look up this report online and read it carefully. This is a report that was produced by the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And uh, this committee does a periodic review of every country that is a signatory to that convention against racial discrimination, which, amusingly, Israel is. And in 2012, it was Israel's last periodic review in Geneva. And the language that the committee used to talk about Israeli policies was unprecedented in its harshness. It talked in these terms, quote, segregation between Jewish and non-Jewish communities and a lack of equal access to land and property inside the pre-67 borders. Notice that they're not talking about the West Bank or Gaza Strip there, but the UN committee was talking about segregation and a lack of equal access to land and property inside the pre-67 lines, inside so-called good Israel. And then when it comes to the West Bank, the committee talked about, quote, a regime of de facto segregation, severe enough to prompt a reminder of the prohibition of apartheid. And that is the first time since the time of apartheid South Africa that that UN committee has felt it necessary to call a state party's attention to the prohibition of apartheid. That, part of that document there is just a sort of cold UN document style breakdown of different Israeli policies that amount to racial segregation and breach the convention on the prohibition of apartheid. So that's, that's a little something about apartheid as a framework, reminding you that the point is not a comparison with South Africa, 
but the fact that apartheid exists under international law and you can take it as a framework and you can apply it in any particular situation to see if it is relevant there. Secondly, before getting into the nitty gritty of how Israel treats the Palestinians today, a few words about this formulation, Jewish and democratic. And actually, it's particularly topical because I don't know how many people in this room sort of regularly follow Palestine and Israel stuff on the news, but currently one of the issues that's swirling around within Israeli politics at the moment is the proposed law that is designed to um, more explicitly define Israel as a state of the Jewish people. Okay, so this, we don't know yet exactly how that law will look like, what version of it will be passed, if a version of it is passed. But this topic of Israel defining itself as a Jewish state is very much in the news. And one of the uh, problems that I've felt in the way that this topic is being covered in the mainstream is that there is an assumption that this new law, this proposed new law to define Israel as a Jewish state, this bill, somehow represents a quite extreme break from the status quo. Somehow takes Israel, quote unquote, rightwards. Now you have to remember when it comes to Israeli politics, you take your normal concept of a political spectrum and you shift it across to the right to begin with. But there's an important point to be made here, and this is what I'm going to be unpacking a little bit here, which is the extent to which Israel already and has always defined itself as a Jewish state, as opposed to a state for all its citizens, Jewish or non-Jewish. <laughs> and the beginning of that issue, the beginning of the entire question of Palestine, principally, is the Nakba, which is Arabic for catastrophe, and it's the word the Palestinians use to describe what happened to them as a people and as a society when the state of Israel was established in 1948, and in being established, ethnically cleansed the majority of the indigenous Palestinian population from their homes and villages. Around 90% of all of the Palestinians who would have been inside what then became Israel were expelled and were prevented, forcibly prevented of course, from returning home. And that is the same until this day. Again, no time to go into this in a lot of detail, but I'm going to flag up three laws that the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli parliament, passed in the first few years of the state's existence. These are three laws that are a sort of uh, their own axis of evil, if you can put it that way, in terms of defining the boundaries of inclusion and exclusion. These are the legal framework of an ethnocracy, not a democracy. The three laws I'm talking about are the absentee property law, the law of return, and the citizenship law. Briefly, what those laws did and do individually and collectively is the following. They say, on the one hand, any Jewish person anywhere in the world can move to Israel and receive citizenship. At the same time, all of the Palestinians who were expelled in the Nakba are stripped of their citizenship in what would have been their state too. And in, in addition, the properties of those expelled Palestinian refugees are expropriated by the state to use as the state wishes. So those three laws <coughs> define the boundaries of inclusion and exclusion in an ethnocracy, not a democracy. They were the key legal pillars of a settler colonial project designed to transfer land from the indigenous Arab Palestinian population into the hands of the new state of Israel. And every time that you hear people talk about Israel having a natural right to defend or protect its so-called Jewish majority, remember this. The only reason why Israel has a Jewish majority to protect and defend is because of the historic and ongoing violent exclusion of the Palestinian people. That is the only reason why there is a Jewish majority there today. It is an artificial, violently established and violently maintained majority. Now Israel, and this is obviously pertinent to the, the issue that's in the news at the moment, does not have a formal constitution, nor does the UK for that matter. Israel instead has a series of so-called basic laws, and they form a kind of quasi-constitutional structure uh, to do with the parliament and elections and the army and so forth. And I'm going to flag up one of these basic laws as a way of showing you the way in which systematic discrimination is already present 
in Israeli legis legislation, but not in such an overt, neon light flashing way. And confusingly enough, the example I'm giving is a law that was passed in 1992 called Basic Law Human Dignity and Liberty. So a reasonably recent law. And you can tell by its very nice title that actually it looks like a law that will protect the rights of minorities within the state, the rights to dignity and liberty. <clears throat> that basic law explicitly and deliberately did not include a right to equality. And more importantly than that, there is this clause in it. Quote, there shall be no violation of rights under this basic law except by a law befitting the values of the state of Israel enacted for a proper purpose and to an extent no greater than is required. Now what is the purpose of this so-called limitation clause? The values of the state of Israel are as a Jewish and democratic state. So in other words, if it is deemed necessary to infringe on a citizen's rights in order that the state's value as a Jewish state is protected, that's okay according to this basic law. And that is how this basic law has been interpreted by Israel's so-called liberal Supreme Court, which I will have the pleasure of returning to later. <coughs> Finally, on this topic, before we get into some of the policies, these are the words of Ariel Sharon, of course, former Israeli Prime Minister and war criminal, and he talked about it in these terms in both the Knesset and the UN. So Sharon said this, he said that Arabs, <laughs> not Palestinians of course, Arabs have rights in the land, the italics are my emphasis, but all rights over the land of Israel are Jewish rights. Remember, he's speaking these words as the Prime Minister of the country. And he's saying this. He's saying, okay, there are some Arabs here. It's unfortunate, but they're here. And we are granting them generously conditional rights. But rights to the land itself, rights to the land itself, to the land of Israel, belong, according to Arusharon, to the Jewish people in general. And that's not just a semantic difference, that is a very important difference, which informs and shapes state policy. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, Ruth Gavison is the name of a, a prominent, well-respected Israeli legal scholar, who actually has been involved, um, in some ex to some extent, in the discussions about a possible new Jewish state law. Anyway, about a decade ago, Ruth Gavison wrote an essay in which she was defending the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state. So of course you would expect uh, Ruth Gavison in this essay to make the most positive case possible for the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state. As she does that, she is more honest about what that means than many people today who talk about this uh, issue. She wrote this, the Jewish state is thus an enterprise in which the Arabs are not equal partners. Remember, she's not talking about Arabs in Lebanon or Syria or Iraq or somewhere like this. She's talking about Palestinians with citizenship. But she's saying that in a Jewish state, they are not equal partners. And she goes on to elaborate, quote, the needs of Jewish nationalism justify certain restrictions on the Arab population in Israel, particularly in areas such as security, land distribution, population dispersal, and education. It's not, it's not trivial issues. It's not just a question of Palestinian citizens being unable to emotionally identify with the Hatikva. Okay? It's actually a question of systematic discrimination in substantial areas of policy. Areas of policy where a state is meant to be not distinguishing between its citizens on an ethno or religious basis. But it is precisely on that basis that Israel treats Palestinian citizens. And that's what I'm going to go into now. So I want to just flag up again the fact that in this section on policies, <coughs> I'm going to give you uh, a, just a selection, of course, there are a lot, but I'm going to give you a selection of examples that affect, on the one hand, firstly, Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, and secondly, Palestinians who are in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Now, Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, they make up 20% more or less of all Israeli <coughs> citizens. They are the Palestinians and their descendants who were not expelled in the Nakba. 
Actually, some of them were, which I'll come back to in a moment. But effectively, they are the remnant of the Palestinian population um, after the ethnic cleansing of 48. Now, from 1948 through to today, one of the key defining aspects of the relationship between the Israeli state and its Palestinian minority has been land confiscation. Now, here's a statistic to give you an idea of the scale of what we're talking about. Between 1948 and 1953, that is the first five years of the State of Israel's existence, 95%, that's almost every single one, 95% of new Jewish communities established in that five-year period were built on the land of expelled Palestinians, <coughs> using the kinds of laws that I've mentioned already. <coughs> By 1950, cooperative settlements, which mean things like the kibbutzim, so-called socialist communities, uh, only if you're Jewish, hold 45% of abandoned or confiscated Palestinian land. And by the mid-1970s, so 30 years on, the average Palestinian community inside the 67 lines had lost between two-thirds and three-quarters of its land. So what you'll see is, is that the Nakba did not start and finish in 1948. The Nakba continued, and the State of Israel proceeded the process of internal colonization. Internal colonization that targeted and continues to target the Palestinians who have got Israeli citizenship. And finally, one in four Palestinian citizens of Israel are so-called present absentees. What does that mean? What is a present absentee? A present absentee is a Palestinian citizen of Israel who in 1948 was expelled or left their village but instead of ending up the wrong side of the new border, like most Palestinian refugees, they actually ended up in what, still, what then became Israel. Okay? So they became internally displaced. But you would imagine, after hostilities had ended, they would be able to go back to their homes and their villages. No, because even though they were inside the state of Israel, even though they received Israeli citizenship, the state still confiscated their land under the absentee property law for the simple reason that they were Palestinian citizens, not Jewish citizens. Um, again, it doesn't matter if you can't see it, but this is a picture of uh, Palestinians marching, Palestinians inside 48 marching <coughs> to the site of a destroyed village, Sephoria, outside of Nazareth. This is in 2008. <coughs> and every year, when the State of Israel marks Independence Day, Palestinian citizens mark Nakba Day, Catastrophe Day. And they, they sort of mark it with these kinds of marches to the sites of destroyed villages. And okay, another, another aspect of it. Now from 48 through to today, the Israeli state has pursued policies referred to as Judaization policies. Now that is not a word that I've just made up. That is a word that the Israeli government and that regional authorities have used themselves to describe this process. And the logic behind the process is simple, if horrific. The logic of the process is that in a particular area of the state, there can be too many of the wrong kind of citizen, and not enough of the right kind of citizen. In other words, in areas of the state where there are too many Palestinian citizens, the state has been keen to change that demographic situation in those different areas. And two areas in particular that has impacted on is the Galilee in the north, and the Nakab or the Negev in the south. One example of what that has looked like. In the late 70s and the early 1980s, the Israeli government working with the Jewish agency established so-called mitzpin, which literally means lookout. Okay, so a militaristic uh, language used to describe these communities. Lookout communities now, in, in the Galilee. Now why did they create these communities? Quote, to keep Arab villages from attaining territorial continuity. That's from a planning document of the Jewish Agency. To keep Arab villages from attaining territorial continuity. That is the most exciting way that I've ever heard a planning document described. <laughs> housing, Israel's housing minister in 2009 said that it was a national duty to prevent the spread of Palestinian citizens. As Israel's elected, or the housing minister of Israel's elected government calling it a national duty to prevent the spread of Palestinian citizens. And Ehud Olmert, 
speaking then as the mayor of Jerusalem before he also went on to become prime minister and another war criminal, said, quote, a matter of, it's a matter of concern when the non-Jewish population rises a lot faster than the Jewish population. It's a matter of concern when the non-Jewish population rises a lot faster than the Jewish population. Now I want you to think, where have you heard that kind of language before? Where are the groups in our own societies who talk like that? And where would you place them on the political spectrum? And then remember that we're not talking here about a fringe, marginal political group in Israel. We're talking about the ideology that has shaped every single Israeli government from 1948 through to today. I could have picked a hundred quotations like this. I've picked two from the housing minister and at that time the mayor of Jerusalem. The mayor of Jerusalem to point out that these are the beliefs of the highest level of elected officials. Another example, again, we haven't even got on to talk about the West Bank and Gaza yet. There are tens of thousands of Bedouin Palestinian citizens who live in so-called unrecognized villages. Unrecognized villages. You can file it up there with present absentees as the weird vocabulary of Israeli apartheid. What is an unrecognized village? An unrecognized village is a Palestinian community that the state of Israel does not recognize as officially existing. So therefore, even though its residents are citizens, their communities are not connected to the infrastructure of the state. As a result, they face home demolitions of an unpredictable nature, they face the sort of humanitarian problems that you would expect from having difficult or impossible access to infrastructure like water and electricity. Why are they even there? Like, why are they not recognized? Back in the 60s, when the Israeli government was mapping the, the land under its control according to purpose, it was saying, okay, this is residential land, this is you know, agricultural land, this is commercial land, etc., etc. But what it did was, is that it marked land that had pre-existing Palestinian villages in them as being non-residential. So in other words, with the sort of stroke of a bureaucratic pen, you render these villages illegitimate. And in an extra dark twist, some of those villages were only in their actual location because the Israeli military had expelled its residents there in the 1950s. Currently, there is a pending plan and it's been sort of paused, so we don't know the time scale or exactly what it's going to look like. But there is a plan that's been referred to as the Prava Plan, and this is an Israeli government plan which they call Developing the Negev. By the way, I'm going to give up doing this, because when you talk about Israeli policies, you have to do this a lot to make sure that you don't think I'm actually supporting the messed up thing that I'm talking about. So I think you can just sort of assume that if I say something that sounds ludicrous and racist, that I don't actually advocate it. Okay, so um, the Israeli government refers to developing the Negev, right? So you can imagine that I'm developing the Negev. What that, what that means is, what that means is the expulsion of 30 to 40,000 Palestinian Bedouin citizens from their unrecognized villages. I did it again, you have to do it. And then putting them in government approved shanty towns. Why? Shimon Peres, um, obviously just recently uh, the Israeli president, and for some reason that to me is a genuine mystery, enjoys a reputation in the West as a dove. He talked about the reason for this sort of focus on the negative in these terms in 2005. He told US officials that Israel had lost land in the Negev to the Bedouin, remembering to, <coughs> to citizens. He'd, Israel had lost land in the Negev to the Bedouin and would need to take steps to relieve the demographic threat. Mr. Dove talking about his own <coughs> citizens as constituting a demographic threat because they're not Jewish. And this is a picture from Nakab of al Arakib village, which has been demolished, I think probably close to 80 times now, around 80 times. Uh, Israeli state forces come, they demolish it, the residents return and rebuild it again. It's also an example of Palestinian samud, or steadfastness. Coming to just a couple of other examples that I've included here related to Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, who remember, have actually got it sort of as good as it gets, like in the general scheme of Israeli apartheid. Uh, admission committees, so-called admission committees, operate in around 70% of Israeli communities. 
uh, and they are legislated for in 42% of cases. Now what these admission committees do is, for these Israeli towns in which they operate, they decide who can live in these communities. So if you want to live in that community, you have to be accepted by this admissions committee. And one of the criteria by which the admissions committee will assess your application is, quote unquote, <coughs> social suitability. Now it doesn't take a genius to work out how a criteria like social suitability might be used to filter out undesirables. And, surely enough, in the words of Human Rights Watch, the admission committees have, quote, notoriously been used to exclude Arabs from living in rural Jewish communities. Rural Jewish communities that in many cases have actually been built on the land of ethnically cleansed Palestinian villages. Um, I won't go into a bit of time, I'm going to move on. And this is the last example that I'm going to give as it relates to Palestinians with Israeli citizenship. And what I'm talking about is the separation of Palestinian families by law in Israel. So uh, in, back in uh, the early 2000s, it's been around for about a decade or more, uh, temporary legislation was passed and then constantly, re uh, consistently renewed since then. And what that legislation says is, is that an Israeli citizen, um, if, they are, if they marry a Palestinian from the West Bank or Gaza Strip, that Palestinian spouse cannot live with their husband or wife inside the state of Israel. Okay? They can't get the residency or citizenship to be united with their spouse. Now, of course, that almost exclusively affects Palestinian citizens. So in other words, if you're a Palestinian from Haifa and you're looking to marry a Palestinian from Janine in the West Bank, the Israeli law is preventing you as a couple, as a husband and wife, from legally living together in Haifa. Why? The Israeli state, when they began this law, and when they have renewed it, have often justified this law in the name of security, which I'm sure does not come as a massive surprise to anybody in this room. Now, the security rationale itself is flimsy, because the argument was, or is, is that Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza Strip would gain uh, residency in Israel through family unification, and then they would go on to commit terrorist attacks. Now, even, if, even if that was the reason for the law, you could say, okay, well, the Shabak, the Israeli Internal Security Service, they routinely vet Palestinian laborers on an individual basis to work inside Israel. Why couldn't they do it on an individual basis for husbands and wives? But that would be to waste time, because that's not the reason why the law exists. The law exists because of Israel's settler colonial obsession with demographics. The obsession of a state that has artificially created a Jewish majority and wishes to preserve it through racist legislation. Now, when that law was appealed by Israeli human rights groups, it got up to the level of, and I gave you a trailer of this body earlier, the Israeli Supreme Court. <laughs> what would the Israeli Supreme Court say about a law that separates husbands and wives? Because one of them is from the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Can we put our hope in this liberal bastion of democracy and human rights? Uh, no. So, when the Israeli Supreme Court ruled on this, the majority defended the existence of this law in the following terms. Quote, human rights are not a prescription for national suicide. Human rights are not a prescription for national sui suicide. And in that pithy phrase, the Israeli Supreme Court not only detonates what should have, you know, if any vestige remains of its so-called liberal image, that phrase should blow that up. And secondly, that phrase flags up you know, very prominently, the fact that what we're talking about here is not something that is the same as South African apartheid, but something that looks very much like it. Because this obsession with equality equaling national suicide is the same discourse that we saw from the leaders of the South African regime in days gone by. A member of Knesset, uh, who sort of praised the court's ruling at the time, talked about it in the following terms talked about it as being about, quote, separation between the people and the need to maintain a Jewish majority and the Jewish character of the state, black and white. Excuse the pun, very simple. Separation between the peoples and the need to maintain a Jewish majority and the Jewish character of the state. Nothing about security. Everything about demographics and ethnic separation from the state that tells us it's the only democracy in the Middle East. 
from the state whose defenders and advocates talk about how it's this bastion of liberalism and freedom. And this is how its elected representatives justify separating husbands and wives. And in case you need a reminder, this is from Apartheid South Africa, the National Party's platform in 48, coincidentally. Quote, either we must follow the course of equality, which must eventually mean national suicide for the white race, or we must take the course of separation. So, uh, I'm going to move on to looking at ways in which Palestine, uh, Israeli policies affect Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. And I would encourage people to think about ways in which these are very similar in essence, sometimes very similar in actual policy, but crucially similar in essence, but worked out in different ways. So one um, aspect of, uh, of the military occupation that's been going on for almost half a decade now, the vast majority of the state of Israel's existence has meant a military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. One part of that, of course, is East Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, which Israel illegally annexed, an annexation not recognized by any other country in the world. And in that apartheid city, in that apartheid so-called capital, Palestinian residents face things like planning restrictions, home demolitions, <coughs> discrimination in municipal services, and of course, the community-shattering apartheid wall. The current mayor of Jerusalem, Nir Barkat, openly and explicitly will tell you, if you ask him, as the BBC's Heart Talk did a couple of years ago, that he believes in maintaining a Jewish majority in the city of which he is the mayor. Again, ask yourself, what sort of politician in Britain, where would they be on the spectrum, if they said that their main, one of their key policies for the city is to make sure that one particular ethno-religious group maintain the majority. Of course, one of the aspects of Israeli apartheid that a lot of people are familiar with are the illegal settlements, the colonies that have been established, that have been established across the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Around half a million, more than half a million Israelis living in these settlements now. And alongside, around these illegal colonies, live Palestinians who don't have Israeli citizenship, of course, and whose freedom of movement is restricted and controlled <coughs> by physical obstacles and by a bureaucratic so-called permit regime. Then, of course, there is the apartheid wall itself, not just in East Jerusalem. The majority of the wall lies within the occupied territory, within the West Bank. And that, of course, is the basis for the International Court of Justice's 2004 advisory opinion, the ICJ, which sits in The Hague. And their advisory opinion, as requested by the General Assembly in 2004, stated that Israel's war is illegal in its entirety insofar as it is in the occupied West Bank, which is most of it, that it should be torn down immediately and that compensation should be paid to Palestinians whose lives have already been affected by it. And actually, the ICJ advisory opinion also talked about third-party responsibility for not allowing the reality created by Israel's violations to be respected. In other words, states like the UK, for example, need to uh, sort of conduct their relations with Israel in a way that does not acknowledge this illegal reality that Israel has created. And within the West Bank, the majority of it, territory-wise, 60%, referred to as Area C under Oslo, Palestinians have to apply for <laughs> building permits from the Israeli occupation authorities. Okay, now, you might say, well, that sounds normal, you can't just go out in the middle of Liverpool and build a house without getting permission. But here's how it works. In 2008, a UN report that covered the previous seven years showed that 94% of all Palestinian planning applications are denied. 94%, almost all of them. So in other words, if you're a Palestinian in Area C of the West Bank, Israel has created a legal facade through which it is impossible for you to quote unquote illegally build. And of course, if you've built illegally, Israeli soldiers can come along and issue you with a demolition order. 2011 is one example. 
Israel demolished 620 Palestinian-owned structures in the West Bank because they were illegal. And in that year, the European Union, uh, officials of the EU on the ground in Ramallah and Jerusalem, they talked about this as being, quote, the forced transfer of the native population. The forced transfer of the native population. That is the reality of the only democracy in the Middle East. <coughs> the side, or I want to add as an aside, about the EU, that it is very, it's okay, it does a decent job at recording the crimes of Israeli apartheid, but it does a very bad job in doing anything to stop it, and in fact is directly complicit in enabling them. And these are the words of Human Rights Watch, looking at the big picture in the West Bank. They say that Israel's regime in the West Bank is a two-tier system. Look at the language there, a two-tier system where Palestinians face systematic discrimination. It's not just me talking about Israeli apartheid. It's not just me who sort of goes around talking about systematic discrimination and racism. It's not meaningless incitement. These are actual policies that exist today, that have existed for decades, that are well documented by Palestinians themselves, by international organizations like Human Rights Watch, like, like Amnesty, by Israeli human rights organizations too. And of course, the Gaza Strip, home to 1.8 million Palestinians, the majority of them are registered with the UN as refugees. Why? Why are they refugees? Where have they come from? They've come from inside what today is Israel. The Palestinian refugees in the Gaza Strip live a few miles away from the communities and the lands from which they were expelled in 1948. Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are fenced in, they're subject to blockade. The restrictions on movement that Israel imposed, which go right back to the early 90s, 91, which tightened and harshened, of course, massively in recent years. One example, Israel prevents almost all goods from being sent from the Gaza Strip to the West Bank. Why? What's the security threat in a cucumber? What's the security threat in a table? Why would you stop goods going from the Gaza Strip to the West Bank if you weren't interested, not in security, but in a policy of collective punishment and colonial fragmentation? And finally, of course, and we saw this in all its horrific, bloody reality this year, the Gaza Strip is where Israel is allowed to massacre Palestinians with total impunity. More than 500 children killed by the Israeli army this summer. 170 or so families lost three members of their family in the same incidents. Families uh, breaking fast, having the meal together in their living room. Families sleeping in their beds, wiped out by someone operating a drone, by F-16s, by the military machine that this government allows exports to. Now, this is probably not going to be massively visible to everybody, <coughs> particularly at the back. I don't know also whether it's feasible to like instantly turn the lights off or not. Or are they, there's like loads of them. Maybe you're annoying if you have to go around all of them. But if it's easy, it'll probably just make this bit a little easier. Okay, that's quite dark. Um, no, no, it's okay, that's okay. It won't be for very long. I'm sure people can handle the dark. Okay, so, um, I don't know. I don't know how much, I don't know how far back the sort of usefulness of this goes, but it won't take long anyway. So apologies, and again, like I said, anyone who wants the presentation can ask me. So this is a map specifically of the West Bank, and I'm just going to rattle through. There are a sequence of maps of the same area, it's UN maps, that show the different ways in which Israel has colonized the West Bank since 1967, okay? Now, that, that map that's there now has got all these sort of burgundy brown blobs and dots all over it, right? Can you see that? Now, that, those are the built-up settlements. Okay, that's the area of the built-up settlements. The next one adds a tiny bit of red, which I'm almost certain most people can't see. That is area, that is land that is taken up by so-called unauthorized settler outposts. Those are settlements so illegal, even the Israeli government thinks they're illegal, but doesn't do actually anything in the majority of cases to get rid of them. The next area of red that's taken up 
is agricultural land that is reserved for the exclusive use of the Israeli settlers. The next area of red, which obviously was quite a large amount, is land restricted to Palestinians because the Israeli army uses it to train its military in. Okay, so it's a military training area. The next area of red is restricted to Palestinians because it has been designated a nature reserve. So the occupation is very environmentally friendly. The next area of red, you can probably guess, is uh, on the wrong side. It's, wrong, it's land that is now on the quote unquote wrong side of the apartheid wall. The next map, which is the last one, shows all these crisscrossy lines across the West Bank. And that is the road network, of course, Israeli controlled, that connects up all these other different components of the colonization process. And when you put all of those bits together, this is what you've got. This is the Palestinian state waiting to happen. This is the Bantustan reality, the Swiss cheese state. It's been around for so long, people have come up with all sorts of funny ways to describe it. And you can see the way in which Israel has deliberately fragmented the West Bank through these different sort of means and methods into these isolated little pieces. Uh, final two, before we can have the lights back up, this is one zoomed in look at Jerusalem specifically. Um, right in the middle is the old city, and there's a dotted line going around that is the Israeli unilaterally defined municipal boundary of Jerusalem, okay, the part that they illegally annexed. And this is from 1987, and you can see again these uh, purple, whatever, blobs <laughs> around. Yeah? Now, the next map is 2005, of the same area. Watch what happens in occupied East Jerusalem and the West Bank between 1987 and 2005. That's what happened. Pre-existing Israeli settlements massively expanded <coughs> and brand new ones are created. Oh, we can have the lights back on, sorry, I don't know who's doing that. And as you can see again, the deliberate intent was to create this uh, sort of Jerusalem envelope they sometimes refer to it as to separate East Jerusalem from the Palestinian West Bank. Okay, um, we've come to the last section, and it won't go on for too long, I promise. Uh, the last section which I have called Rethink to Reimagine. Because a lot of what has come before are specific policies, specific examples of what life means for Palestinians under Israeli apartheid. But I wanted to finish or I wanted to sort of round that all off with some thoughts about the bigger picture and some thoughts about where we are now and where this might be going. The first point I want to make is encouraging people to quote unquote make the links and understand the invisibility of the so-called green line. Now if that sounds like you've no idea what I'm talking about, that's fine. It's more to remind me what I'm about to say. What I mean by this is the following. I don't know how many people here know what the green line is. The green line is obviously not, not so obviously, it's not a massive painted green line. It is, the, in theory, the boundary between territory that Israel held before and after 1967. Okay, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, West Bank including East Jerusalem, is all on the other side of the green line. It's what the international community views as occupied territory. Now what do I mean by the fact that the green line is invisible? <laughs> What do I mean by the fact that we need to make links? By the invisibility of the green line, I mean two things. Number one, that through systematic, intentional colonization procedures, the Israeli government has rendered the green line a practical irrelevancy. When you look, if you think of that map of the West Bank before, imagine it's stripped of like the lines that exist because it's a map. And remember that Israel has incorporated <coughs> huge swathes of the occupied West Bank into the basic infrastructure of the state. You'll have Israelis who live in a settlement, like for example Ariel in the northern West Bank, who will maybe work in Tel Aviv, right, and just commute in and out of the West Bank. Israelis will use the Jordan Valley to, uh, for tourism, whatever. There are many, most of the places where the Green Line exists you don't know you've crossed it. So that is one way in which, I mean, the green line is invisible. But there is a second way, which for me is more important, 
in which I mean the green line is invisible, and it's the following. <coughs> the same priorities are at work whether you look at Haifa, the Nakav, the Galilee, the hills around Hebron, the Jordan Valley, Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem, Nablus, the same thing is going on. The Israeli government pursues policies that sometimes differ in their legal mechanisms, but in their essence are the same. These are the words of uh, Oren Yiftachel, an Israeli professor, and he talked about it a few years ago now as this. The colonized West Bank, the besieged Gaza Strip, and Israel proper, each with its own official set of rules, are merging into one regime system, <coughs> ultimately controlled by the Jewish state. He's talking about the reality of a de facto one state that exists between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. In that area, Mandate Palestine, the State of Israel today controls the lives of all the people who live in that area and affords or denies them privileges and rights on a racially, systematically racist basis. Think about it like this. As for the, in terms of the Palestinian people as a whole, one in seven Palestinians are second-class citizens. They're the lucky ones with Israeli citizenship. One in three are under military rule, their lives controlled by the Israeli military. <coughs> and half of them, just over half of them, are excluded from their homeland altogether because they're the Palestinian refugee community in exile. This is a sequence of maps that I think uh, some version of this quite a few people might be familiar with. This is just showing Jewish slash State of Israel land ownership over a, over a period of time. Going from left to right, on the left hand side, that's <coughs> Jewish land ownership in Palestine in 1917. Then moving across, you've got Jewish land ownership in 1947, so that's one year before the Nakba, where's the Nakba starting really? Then next across, where a lot of it is now coloured in black on the map, that's 1960. So of course now the State of Israel controls most of the land within the State of Israel. <coughs> uh, and then finally on the far right hand side is now. And you'll see now that of course also pieces of the West Bank have been incorporated too. Now this sequence of maps for me is, uh, uh, I like it, I like the sequence of maps. Um, it's showing access. Now on the left hand side, coloured in black, is where you can go, like where you can live, uh, if you've got Israeli citizenship. Next along, second from the left, is your area as a Palestinian with a West Bank ID. Next along, that little sliver in the corner, is your area as a Palestinian with Gaza Strip ID. And the final map, blank, nowhere, is your area as an expelled Palestinian refugee. And the final illustration of the point <coughs> I'm looking to make here, two pictures, left-hand side, a man standing by a demolished property, right-hand side, a woman sitting in front of a demolished property. Unless you knew beforehand there's no way that anybody here could tell me which one of those was taken in the occupied West Bank and which one of those was taken inside the pre-67 lines. On the left-hand side, that's a photo from the West Bank in the Jordan Valley. The right-hand side, it's a woman in al Arakib in the Negev. A woman with Israeli citizenship. This man does not have Israeli citizenship, but they're both Palestinians. And what is going on here is the same thing. Palestinians are having their homes and their properties destroyed using legal mechanisms that are designed to discriminate against them, while alongside them, or maybe in the future, in their place, Jewish communities grow and thrive and appear. <laughs> so finally, when I talk about rethinking, I mean the following. Rethinking so that we have an approach to this question that is based on the reality on the ground. 
Not on the reality 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. Not based on the reality that like, exists in our own head, but actually based on the reality on the ground now. And an approach that is based on the failure of the so-called peace process. I've actually even given its own little apostrophes, I notice, on the slide. Not two, for some reason, I don't know why. Um, I say that the failure of the peace process, but of course, if you were being looking at it in a different way, uh, you could say that it's been a success because the so-called peace process, as shaped by the international community and by the US through the Oslo paradigm, has always been about a never-ending process that brings no peace, and certainly no peace with justice for the Palestinians. But let's just assume, for the sake of argument, that the peace process has been intended to bring about peace. Right. Just, just bear with me on that one. It's obviously been a manifest failure because we're talking two decades of the same approach that has brought about nothing like peace, but only steady and growing colonization of Palestinian land. Secondly, rethink in order to what I've put here as move beyond occupation discourse. Now, it's actually easier for me to explain what I don't mean in order to explain what I do. And what I don't mean is that as people who are trying to educate and talk about and organize around the issue of Palestine, that we shouldn't focus on those cases and examples where Israeli apartheid is at its most severe and brutal. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a focus on Gaza or on the demolitions in the southern Hebron Hills, etc. But what I do mean is that we have to make sure that we place those particular examples in their wider context. Okay? What it does mean is that we have to remember that those cases are part of a bigger regime, part of a bigger regime that controls the land from the river to the sea, that discriminates against Palestinians, whether they've got citizenship or whether they don't. It also means, and one would hope that this would be potentially obvious, um, even from the few examples that I've given, <coughs> we need to rethink the orthodoxy about Israel's so-called democratic credentials. And as we do all of that rethinking, we will have to, and do, resist attempts to fence off debate, to make taboo, a serious discussion about Israel's so-called right to be a Jewish state. Now this is very important. Personally speaking, I don't think it's a coincidence that I occasionally face some sort of opposition when I am speaking in places on the basis that these are the kinds of issues that I am keen to discuss. Here is another uh, way to illustrate what I'm talking about. The current probably not for that much longer, <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister of this country is Nick Clay. And a few years ago, he went on the radio and he talked about Israeli settlements in the West Bank as being a so-called act of vandalism. That was his words. Pretty strong language, an act of vandalism. He didn't just say they were illegal or annoying. He said they were an act of vandalism. Now, Nick Clay... He's got his own political career issues to deal with, but that did not give him an extra one. There was no serious repercussions for Nick Clegg for talking about Israeli settlements in the West Bank as being an act of vandalism. Why? Because thankfully there's been progress in this country. There's been progress in the sense that a large number of Israeli policies are routinely criticised and condemned, even by the political class in Westminster. However, Nick Clegg or anybody else within a position like his will not go on the radio tomorrow or the next day and say something along the lines of this. You know, I think we need to ask some serious questions about whether Israel has got a right to exist as a Jewish state because of what that means for the Palestinian people. That is still an area that for many people is considered off limits and considered taboo. And of course, that red line not a green line, is enforced, or attempts to make it, to attempts to enforce it, are made using things like the old classic anti-Semitism smith. Now after all of that rethinking, 
there's actually a positive act of reimagining. Reimagining a future, genuine coexistence of equals. Unfortunately, there are people today, and well, this has been around for a while now, and it often happens on campuses, there are people today who take a concept like coexistence and abuse it and manipulate it in order to justify and protect the colonial status quo. Coexistence is not about sharing hummus and then going home and feeling awesome about yourself. You know, painful update for some people. But coexistence per se is not a bad thing. Coexistence is a real, like, admirable goal if you've dismantled the asymmetri asymmetrical power relations that keep one group having privileges that another group is denied. Reimagine also an understanding of self-determination that means two groups <coughs> sharing one land. Reimagine so that the struggle is pointing towards things like the language that we use in solidarity, democratization and decolonization. And this last quotation, this last point, take it from a, I took it from a website made by an amazing group of Palestinians, a website's called Arena of Speculation. Uh, and they put it like this, reimagine so that instead of can we return or when will we return, Palestinian refugees ask what kind of return do we want to create for ourselves? Last slide. I'm sure many people here have heard of Moshe Dayan, the famous Israeli leader. His father sat in the first Israeli Knesset, and in 1950, Shmuel Dayan said this, maybe not allowing the refugees back is not right and not moral, but if we become just and moral, I do not know where we will end up. Now, it's not 1950 anymore, it's 2014. And I think there is an answer to his rhetorical question that isn't an answer of walls and tanks and fear and privilege, but there is an answer to that question of defiance and of hope. And I'll finish <laughs> with the words of the late, great Edward Said, who wrote this. Coexistence, sharing and community must win out over exclusivism, intransigence and rejectionism. And I'd simply add to that, there's no time to lose. Thank you very much. really informative and very insightful. Um, I would love now if we could take your questions, um, any, even just comments, and we could have maybe a discussion. However, in order for us to do this, it's important that we all respect everybody's <coughs> opinion. I don't want any discrimination or um, any sort of abusive language. Uh, so does anyone have any questions? Three, three. Yeah. Take, take three, uh, three to go. Three in a go, yeah, we'll take three in a go, and I'm standing up because I'm quite small and I don't miss anything. <laughs> yes? I wonder, it was great that, Ben, thanks very much. I wonder if you could tell us the background to the UN report, the Judge Goldstein report, and actually what happened to it? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I, um, after all this, I wanted to go to Israel and see what this apartheid has found in all these words, these very powerful words. And um, I think my first shot was um, obviously arrived in Bangalore Airport. And um, I did see, um, I believe, them to be Arabs um, going on trains and go having businesses. I bought a platform in Haifa from an Arab business that I believe that he was an Israeli Arab. And he seemed to be really happy with that. I haven't spoken to every Arab that lives in Israel. But I was told that 20% of 
of the Israeli population is not Jewish, and that 20% is um, Muslim Arab, Christian Arab, um, Baha'i, and um, I think Druze is the other one. And a lot of them seem to be just having full life into university in Israel and, and across the Green Line in mixed universities between Israelis and people who live on the West Bank. So there's a lot more dialogue than what I've been hearing on the news and in, you know, writings like this. And I can find it difficult to reconcile what's been said to what I've witnessed on the Israel side of the fence for the Arab and non Jewish population of this on the Israel side. Thank you. Um, and one more? Uh, yes. Yeah, when European Parliament, when parliaments of the European governments pass uh, resolutions recognizing Palestinian statehood, right, the Israeli government complains. But they don't seem to complain very loudly, right? Could it be that secretly they really welcome these types of resolutions from the European governments because in, it implies the continued existence of a Jewish state, right? And, and add on to that, what relevance do you think these resolutions actually have? Should I stand up? Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> okay. um, by popular demand, I have stood up again. The, okay, so three questions. The first question relates to the so-called Goldstone Report. So uh, that's basically a shorthand for uh, a UN report that was produced through the mechanism of the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, and that emerged uh, after so-called Operation Castlet, when Israel conducted another large-scale massacre against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip at the end of 2008, beginning of 2009. Now, the UN um, inquiry that was conducted into that was led by this judge, Richard Goldstone. The uh, report, when it came out, talked about Israeli war crimes, it talked about civilians being shot, it talked about collective punishment, it talked about all the ways in which many of us already know and already knew Israel treats the Palestinians, and of course, we all thought Operation Cast Lead Massacre was an unparalleled event. And unfortunately, it turns out that the Israeli military had something worse in store, which is what we saw this summer. Now, what happened with that is, as a report itself, nothing. The report still exists. The report's still there. It's still an actionable report in the sense that if anybody wants to use it in that way. <laughs> and of course, there have been efforts to prosecute Israeli officials involved with Operation Cast Lead through universal jurisdiction, which shamefully is a legal mechanism that the British government has tried to restrict only after Israeli government pressure. But I, I think that your reference to it is because of the fact that after the, after the fact, sometime after the fact, Goldstone himself wrote an article in which he seemed to be rowing back on some aspects of the report's claims. And of course, uh, people who until that point had been perfectly willing to dump on him and to say he didn't know what he was talking about, suddenly realized that he was amazing and spoke the truth every time. And the thing is with this, is that an op-ed, I mean, I write op-eds, don't get me wrong, I like them, but ultimately, it's just an op-ed. It's 800 words that Goldstone thought would be good to write. And it doesn't have the legal weight. It doesn't have the fact that the Goldstone report was the work of more than one judge, and that was requested and approved by the UN Human Rights Council, etc. And Goldstone did that for his own reasons. And he did not disprove anything from the report. He just decided, because he had been under a huge amount of pressure from within his own community as a Jewish South African, a huge amount of pressure, uh, basically because of the fact that he was associated with this report that from Israel's point of view was critical in accelerating what Israel sees as delegitimization. Now, for nobody, for people who haven't heard the use of that term before, Israel and its lobby groups refer to delegitimization in the sense that 
Around the world, more and more people are willing to show solidarity with Palestine, thanks. <coughs> and around the world, more and more people are not willing to accept the idea that Israel can just do what it wants with impunity. So I, there, I, wrote, uh, I, I wrote one article specifically about this Goldstone um, sort of retraction quote, quote uh, so that's probably like, easily findable, but that's the basic sort of story behind that. Now, secondly, um, <coughs> obviously, I'm sort of as, as pleased as you are that there are happy Arabs on trains uh, in, in Israel. Um, but the, the, sort of, the sort of policies that I've been talking about here uh, do not contradict the idea that a Palestinian citizen can use a train uh, or, or run a business. Um, because there's a few things to point out. Number one, I also mentioned this in the presentation, in terms of the Palestinian people as a whole, it's only one in seven of them that got Israeli citizenship. Okay, so the vast majority of Palestinians can't open a shop in Haifa, uh, even if they're from Haifa, even if their family is from there, because they're expelled and can't go back because they didn't happen to be born Jewish. Uh, and the vast majority of Palestinians can't work hand in hand, in hand with Jewish doctors in these hospitals um, that are microcosms of Israeli democracy. And the vast majority of Palestinians can't vote in the Knesset election either. Because only one in seven of Palestinians have got Israeli citizenship. So straight away, before we even look at the real reality of Palestinian <laughs> citizens, we have to acknowledge the fact that Israeli apartheid has stripped and denied the majority of Palestinians of their right to live in their own homeland. And for those minority of Palestinians who have got Israeli citizenship, I am sure that you would agree, sort of having looked at this aspect of it that I've been talking about this evening, that being denied the right to live in 70% of communities because you're not Jewish, being prevented from living with your husband or your wife <coughs> because they're from the West Bank, having a discriminatory and disproportionate education system, which I didn't mention, having your elected officials talk about you as representing a threat to the state on the basis of your race. I'm sure those things, if they were implemented in this country, towards any minority group would not be greeted with a shrug or a sense of confusion. They would be greeted with moral outrage, the sort of moral outrage, it's okay, thank you very much, they would be greeted with the sort of moral outrage that it deserves. Thirdly, on the question of um, recognition by European parliaments. Right, so there was sort of two aspects of this question, one of which, what is the significance or usefulness of them in and of itself? And secondly, you brought in a very useful and important angle which is connected to the other question, which is, um, well, the way you phrased it is, um, shouldn't the Israeli government be sort of um, happy about this because the implication, or indeed the actual text of some of these resolutions, affirms the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state within the borders, um, uh, within the pre-67 borders. Um, if I take the example of the British Parliament vote, which obviously is not a binding vote, um, but was passed with an easy majority, as many people will be aware of. For me, that vote is more an indication and a symptom of a wider trend that is a positive trend. It's an indication of the fact that, as I referred to earlier, even within the mainstream British political class, expressing support for Palestinian rights in some way is now a mainstream position. Uh, and criticism of Israeli policies, like settlements and home demolitions and war crimes in Gaza, etc., is also a mainstream position. And it is important to recognize that that rec represents progress, because that, is not the, that was not the case even 10 years ago. So for me, the parliament vote in Britain is less useful in and of itself, and it's more useful as an illustration or an example of, uh, of, of this wider trend that is taking place, of course, even more forcefully at the quote-unquote civil society level, in churches and trade unions and students on campuses and cultural workers, etc., etc. Um, but it's useful, the, the usefulness of these resolutions is very limited. Now, what's sort of ironic is that uh, the issue of Palestine is becoming mainstreamed amongst European political elites in the context of affirming a two-state solution exactly at the time that plenty of people are recognizing that the two-state solution is dead. So these, rec these recognitions in Parliament are actually sort of 20, 30 years late. 
Now, not only are they 20, 30 years late, they do, as you point out, fit in to the international uh, peace process paradigm, the Oslo paradigm, which isn't actually designed to enforce international law. It's designed to um, supplant international law and replace international law. It's meant to provide a peace process seen through an Israeli paradigm, by which the concern, who, who here has ever heard someone on the TV, a politician or a pundit, talk about a Palestinian right to self-defense and security? as opposed to the number of times we hear that about Israel. That, of course, is because with all the progress that we've made, the dominant paradigm is still the colonizer's paradigm. Be that as it may, I will just make one reference which connects this to uh, the current Israeli political scene. So the Knesset's been dissolved, and there's going to be new Israeli elections, it would appear. Um, and as part of that process, this week, it seems that Sipi Livni, another Israeli war criminal, by the way, um, is going to be making an alliance with Labour, the Labour Party, uh, for the elections. Now, the current Israeli government, and the one that's been around for a few years now, that is represented by Netanyahu, it's represented by Naftali Bennett, the economy minister, who openly and explicitly opposes the creation of a Palestinian state, even within the 67 lines. Same with Lieberman. Jewish Home, uh, Yisrael Beteinu, Likud, these are parties that oppose the two-state solution. And within the context of Israeli Zionist political parties, Sipi Livni is, relatively speaking, smarter. Why? Because she understands that a lot of people, a lot of international leaders, are desperate to finish this issue, to have the ethnic cleansing of Palestine rubber stamped, to have the state of Israel as a Jewish state within 78, 77, 80% of Monday Palestine affirmed, and for it all to be behind us and to get on with business, literally. Uh, and Livni gets that. And that's why um, Western politicians would much prefer that somebody like Livni and Labour were in power. Because they see them, those guys as people who are willing to play ball in the context of an international peace process that doesn't serve the Palestinian people's rights or priorities. But the current Israeli government and the trend in Israeli politics is towards the rejectionist, even more extreme side of the spectrum that basically doesn't care about, about that, that whole side of international relations, that, that thinks that Israel can just continue with the status quo and continue cementing the the, the current state of apartheid. So that's, that's a bit of a sort of sidetrack from your question, but it's related, um, I think, to, to the issues. Thanks. I hope that answered your question. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. White, for the great talk, uh, for highlighting the urgency of acting, uh, also for um, highlighting all the failures uh, of the Israel state in dealing with that, as highlighted by the reports from the UN, from by several politicians. Stuff like that. Uh, that being said, in light of this presentation, I am uh, asking the, the member, uh, the elected staff uh, of the Liverpool Guild, Guild of Students, uh, to maybe explain us why uh, it's the second time that we have a meeting on this issue to uh, discuss the BDS motions. Uh, it's the second time that we don't reach quorum. Is this issue going to be discussed because it's urgent? Uh, are procedural guidelines going to be there to make sure that the process is open, that the evidence can be, su can be submitted by parties to make sure that people who want to attend are going to be able to attend, that ad hoc procedure won't be um, relied on every single time there's an event? Uh, is the guild ready to take concrete steps to make sure that this debate happens in a meaningful way, in a respectful way, and that Friends of Palestine is not prevented from uh, making that discussion happen because they've been trying and it's not the first time that we have a problem with the uh, guild with regards to that issue. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think... <laughs> I think just because this is such a, a big issue in the sense of um, BDS, uh, maybe this might be a good um, problem to tackle on its own. As well, to give a little bit of background to um, those non-students here or those who don't know what's going on, 
Um, currently, the University of Liverpool Friends of Palestine is trying to get our student body to adopt a boycott, divesting, and sanction motion. However, um, many of us feel that uh, the new system of democracy for the Guild is damaging our sort of efforts. However, um, I'd be interested, Ben, in your opinion of BDS and how you think that this will um, impact it. Yeah. Um, yes? Yeah, yeah uh, one comment and two questions, if I might. The comment is on the question of Israel's right to exist. The interesting thing is, nobody now says that apartheid had the right to exist in South Africa. They said it at the time, but they don't say it now. They, what they by, by and large say, even white South Africans, is, oh, we never supported it. That's, that's their line on it now. If you go further back, nobody in America could I mean, there, there obviously is a far-right fringe in America, but virtually nobody in America would stand up and say uh, the Confederate South uh, you know, should have carried on and slavery had a right to exist. That, that's a dead issue. So, I mean, I think we need to attack quite hard on this idea that Israel has a right to exist. It, the, the people who live in Israel have a right to be there. On that, I have no problem. But the system which they uphold and, and which they defend does not have any right to exist. And we should be just very point blank about that. The questions I wanted to ask you are, uh, first of all, do you we all recognize that the two-state solution is a dead duck. However, do you think there is any possibility that the PA will actually accept an offer, given the kind of bribes that can be offered to them by the World Bank, the IMF, and all of that? And this, a more specific question, can you say what you think the role of USAID is in this story? Yes. Um, I think a lot of people see the Palestinian leadership as, as ineffectual, if not uh, as collaborators, basically. It's not the way you think new leadership will come from, uh, and when it's likely to come, and how it's going to come into existence. All right, nice uh, small questions. <laughs> Um, okay, so sort of following on from uh, the point that was raised here about sort of an internal question, which I sympathise with from what I've heard of it before this before this meeting and from what I said, but um, sort of taking the suggestion to unpack a little bit about about BDS because uh, by the way you can kind of assume that I support it when I use it in that sense. Um, when I'm talking about BDS, there could be people here who don't know what that means or have just heard about it, or are unclear what we're talking about. It stands for Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, and I want to talk about it for a second in a different way to how it's often talked about. I sh I'm sure that all of us, at some point in our lives, have considered or actually boycotted something or other. Why? Because of scenarios like the following. Let's just imagine, and of course this is a hypothetical example that could never happen in real life, that a shoe manufacturer decided to employ child labor. Now let's just say that people discovered that the shoe manufacturer was employing child labor, and people thought, well, that is unacceptable. We are going to appeal to the morals of the people who run this company and ask them to stop child labor. So people write to them and they talk to them and say, you know, it's not good employing child labor. Could you please stop? But again, hypothetically, let's assume that the people who run a company like this are more interested in profit than morals. It might get to the stage where you're like, hmm, this appeal to them on this basis isn't working. How about if we ask people not to buy their products? Now that sort of scenario I don't think many people find difficult to understand. It's using a form of non-violent pressure as a way of making sure that an unjust status quo ends. It's the same when it comes to Palestine. But of course, because we're talking about Israel, people flip out. We're talking about it's the same principle. Israeli violations of international law, Israeli colonization, apartheid and occupation policies, corporations that are complicit in those policies. This is the focus of BDS as a campaign. Remembering, of course, that it comes from a Palestinian call for solidarity, a Palestinian call for people outside to do what they can to challenge Israeli impunity. People will say, why are you singling out Israel for boycott? There are, this is a stupid argument, by the way. Um, there's a lot of reasons why it's a stupid argument. First of all, because Palestinians have asked for it. Okay? Secondly, I would like to know 
if someone who asks that question has ever asked a Tibetan or a Tibetan solidarity activist why they're singling out China. Why is it that only Palestinians are not allowed to ask for solidarity? Why is it only Palestinians who are not allowed to receive our support? Thirdly, it's Israel that has been singled out for privileges and protection for decades. It's Israel that gets aid, military aid, diplomatic shielding, that gets the vetoes in the Security Council. It's Israel that gets the preferential trade agreements, like with the EU, that actually are meant to include a commitment to human rights. It's Israel that is singled out for protection, even as it brutalizes a colonized population. So, BDS is the response of people to that state of affairs, to that impunity, and it is our response to do our bit to make sure there is accountability. So I would thoroughly encourage people here to first of all go on the BDS website, okay, bdsmuslim.net, to look at what Palestinians are calling for, for the right of return of Palestinian refugees, for equality for Palestinian citizens, even if they are happy using the public transportation system, and for the end of military occupation in the West Bank and Gaza. Okay? And then get organized and get involved. Okay? Look for the sensible targets, look for the strategic targets, and don't be put off by all the stuff that comes your way about why you're singing out Israel, why don't we have bridges instead of boycotts, why don't we have homeless instead of Hamas, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Because it is all vacuous nonsense. And it's designed to do one thing and one thing alone. Distract you and protect an apartheid state. Secondly, moving on to uh, this question of like Israel's right to exist. Now, obviously, this is, this is used by Zionists as a kind of like red button issue and a taboo topic and a way of sort of pointing to someone and say they're a quote-unquote a radical or an extremist. Personally speaking, I feel like systematic racial discrimination is an extremist position. Personally speaking, I think that bombing families in their homes is a radical and extremist thing to do. I think that equality between two people, in the eyes of the law, seems reasonably moderate. And so, on that basis, I would urge people to think about it in those terms. The comparison with the, sort of the reference to South Africa was made. There are people demonstrating outside the South African Embassy now for an end to apartheid, but South Africa, the state, exists. The point being that the racist system was dismantled. Now, of course, those who are benefiting from the privileges, as we saw in the Supreme Court's ruling about family separation, <coughs> talked about the idea of national suicide, of course, the group that receives and benefits from the privileges want to tell you that dismantling that structure will mean the end of them. That is the same response that has always been given by whites in the USA, by whites in South Africa. It's the same thing we hear now from Zionists, okay? But actually, that's what I want to say and what I want to encourage people to think about. The vision of equality for a Jew and a Palestinian that is not the extremist vision, okay? That is a vision that is rooted in the idea of things like common humanity, in the idea of practical sharing of limited resources and land, in the idea, shock horror, that Palestinians are equal human beings. So, yeah, I, I definitely sort of affirm this general point about this being an important focus of conversation, and thankfully, it is a conversation that people are having more and more. Uh, I think it was in... 2012, I want to say, or maybe 2013, there was a period of a couple of months where in mainstream US publications, the LA Times, the Nation magazine, and the New York Times, there were three pieces published in reasonably quick succession, all advocating for a one-state solution, and all criticizing the idea of Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state, as opposed to a state for its citizens. These are changing times. They don't change quick enough in the sense that we still have to watch Palestinians being besieged and massacred. But these are changing times. And Israel and its supporters know that too. Uh, I want to also talk about, let's see what we've got here, two-state solution being a dead duck and PA and stuff like that. Okay. Um, the fact that it's changing times it's also um, the case 
in terms of the internal Palestinian scene. And actually, this sort of just links up to the, the third question as well. For some time now, Palestinians in the diaspora and in Palestine have been talking about and organizing around the problems to do with representation in their national bodies and institutions, the idea of democratizing the PLO, of reforming and reviving the PLO, of course, the problem of solving the uh, of national unity. Uh, and plenty of Palestinians, especially those in the West Bank and Gaza who have grown up under Oslo, have seen that the fruits of the so-called peace process are rotten indeed and are not bringing them anything close to liberation or freedom. And they're looking for different answers. Now, this is not going to be a short-term process because these sorts of changes, generational changes, changes, transitions in political vision and strategy do not happen quickly. But you, I see it, I see these, these, uh, these roots, I see these buds sort of flowering in things like, for example, uh, Al Shabaka think tank, a think tank that I recommend to people look up. Al Shabaka, which is predominantly young Palestinians, academics and scholars, looking at big difficult questions to do with the PLO, to do with uh, decolonization, to do with strategies of resistance, etc. etc. I see it in the fact that young Palestinians in 48, those with Israeli citizenship, those in the West Bank and Gaza in exile, are communicating with each other using new media, social media, are organizing popular resistance together across the borders that Israeli colonialism has imposed. <laughs> These things are happening in different places. Uh, and this, the old leadership, uh, in particular the Ramallah-based PA leadership, its only decision really is whether it will adapt or be washed away by the tide. Now, so far, <coughs> the adaption is going slowly. Uh, and many of the people like Mahmoud Abbas and the people around him still seem wedded to a strategy that doesn't work. The strategy being, if we're only good enough, if we're only sort of well-behaved natives enough, maybe the US will pressure Israel into giving us some crumbs off the table. And that, unfortunately, is basically the strategy of Oslo onwards. I once had the fortune slash mis misfortune of hearing Saeb el in person, um, probably in between one of his numerous resignations. And uh, he was asked a question directly by a Palestinian in the audience who said to him, why are your security forces cooperating with the Israeli military? Why are your security forces arresting Palestinians having received orders to do so by the Israeli army? Now, I assumed that El Apart would just ignore this question and move on to something else, but he didn't. He was happy to answer this question. And his answer, his justification for this, was that we have to, paraphrasing him, but this is what he said, we have to show the West that a future Palestinian state will not be a threat. Right? So this is the bankrupt logic, regardless sort of, of a moral judgment, but this is the bankrupt strategic logic at best of the current leadership uh, based in, in, in Ramallah, in the PA and the PLO. But I'd like to maybe highlight, for the sake of sort of a, a, a more positive angle on this, the fresh shoots that I've mentioned before. Okay, the Palestinians, for example, who were, uh, who were inside 48, who organized against the Prava plan in the Nakab. Palestinians in the camps in West Bank, Palestinians in the camps in the region, you know, Palestinians who live in the West, the new Ben Gurion, David Ben Gurion, the first Israeli Prime Minister, the man who oversaw the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, he said, speaking of the Palestinian refugees, whose exile he was the architect, he said of them that the old will die and the young will forget. Famous words. Well, nothing can hold back the decay of time and what it does to the body. But Ben Gurion was proved wrong in one very important aspect, because the young did not forget, and they passed it on to the next generation, and more importantly than that, that generation and the generation after that passed their message on to non-Palestinians, more and more of whom are heeding 
the call for solidarity. Uh, and that is a sort of positive note that I would wish to emphasize, uh, given the sort of horrific nature of the current reality. Thank you. Um, just to fully answer your question, um, the first of the three. Um, for me, the guild system doesn't work because, uh, well, to begin with, I feel it underrepresents a large, uh, well, all the minorities really in the university. I feel like the students who end up there are either <coughs> informed or uh, don't care about really the different situations because uh, there are, let's say, a conflict of interest with these students who are offered money and food. Um, but we have a guild representative who would love Hello. to Hi, everybody. tell us I've about I've been challenged that. twice now, so I'm <laughs> twice in one evening. Um, I'm Alex, I'm vice president of the guild. Um, as Gawain said, he's, he's unhappy with the system. Now, we had something called Guild um, Council before, and basically we had several forums, and nobody turned up to the forum, so there was minimum engagement, uh, really. So we decided in a massive um, rehaul of the whole guild to sort of reconstruct our democratic system. Right? So it got dissolved and it got reconstructed. And this is massively derailing this really excellent talk, by the way. On, um, on the apartheid and everything. It's important. Uh, yeah, it's not too anything. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Excellent. But I'll happily answer any of your questions after I've explained the system. I don't think it's been properly explained. <laughs> Basically, we, from a, demo, um, a demographic um, sort of cross section of the university, we take cross sections 55% um, females at this university, um, there is about 30% international students. Statistics like that are then put into a system and then um, 50 students are then um, selected to be reflective of um, our student body. They then um, are called to what's called the Guild Summit. Um, motions are submitted by students to this summit, and then there's a period of time which evidence can be submitted for or against, and um, these issues are discussed. And the nature in which these issues are discussed is not simply just a vote, because that would be completely unfair on the um, topics at hand. Rather, they are discussed um, through consensus. Um, there are people to facilitate consensus. Um, you get people talking uh, about the issues, and then they, they will talk about them for a very long time. Uh, because, uh, especially an issue like the BDS issue, is considered very important. Very important in the student movement. Uh, very important by the students there, by, formed by the students who submitted it, and by the students who oppose it to. So, that is why it was submitted to the first Guild Summit. Um, and the decision was made because not enough students attended the actual summit itself. Despite our best efforts, they didn't attend, no one attended. Um, that it would go to the next one after it went to our board of trustees, which is the final um, place that these things go to, to ensure financial and sort of um, you know, governance, sustainability of the organisation. Once it went there, it, it had to go back to the next summit because it wasn't passed, um, and then it, it's gone to that summit, um, and the decision made from that, I think, was um, that's for a preferendum overall. Um, was the quorum is, met? What? Was the quorum met at the time? No, the, set, the quorum wasn't met at the second summit, sorry. Can I ask you to be questions? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the quorum wasn't met at the second summit. The quorum wasn't met at the first summit. The things we need to look at with the system, it's fairly obvious. But... How do you elect them? These we, they're not elected. They are. How they are. You, um, they are. Touch with them. Okay, but they're done through. Um, it's done through a computer matrix sorry? with um, data provided um, to us by the university. Yeah. Who provides the data? The the university does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your first point about your um, democratic selection. Well, it sounded lovely, and I loved the percentages. And um, but my main problem was. Uh, in practice, so it's happened and we've had the results and uh, a, a summit discussing BDS, there was not one single member there for, who had any sort of Middle Eastern origin, there was not one single black student present, so I don't know what sort of method you're using to pick these people, but it's obvious that this isn't working, and as well another reason why it's obvious this method won't work is because now with two attempts we, we haven't even reached half of the people who you've invited, and I'm telling you why this is, it's because they don't, these, when you specifically pick people, you are alienating people who are interested in the topics. If you open up these uh, debates, 
people who are for it, people who are against it will come and they will get their voice heard. Um, I would also like to um, sort of talk about this consensus. Now it's a lovely idea again, um, that people, 50 people in a room will uh, agree and uh, everything's wonderful, but it doesn't work in practice. And now I've been at these um, summits. And have you ever seen 50 people agree on anything? Well, I haven't, but I did at these summits. And why? It's because these facilitators, these external facilitators, they have a lot of influence on discussion with 50 people who have never met and know little about the topic concerned. They are enabled to direct a conversation, um, <coughs> even subtly, in ways that it otherwise would not occur. That's the reason why we have a voting system. It's because the whole world can't agree on everything nor can a room of 50 people. Um, and then finally, on the idea of a preferendum, I would love if we could just go straight through with a vote. Every student can either uh, support BDS or say, no, we don't want it. Unfortunately, this preferendum has also got some middle options. Now, these middle options are provided to us by the Guild Board of Trustees, and um, they, they're also going to be sort of provided by the summit. By the summit. Yeah. No, uh, I've heard that they are, the they are recommended by the summit, and that the final decision is by the Guild Board of Trustees. Am I correct? The Guild of Trustees has to amend to change those. They just have to approve them. <laughs> okay. So approved by the Guild uh, Board of Trustees. And this is another reason why I don't think it works, because how can you have a part motion of BDF? You'll only buy some Israeli products? Yeah. I don't know. But, um, that's my opinion. Um, uh, do you want me to sort of apply to what said? you said? Yeah. Um, yeah, Hello. Sorry, can I just mention the System is that the voice who shouts the loudest isn't the only one that's heard. You know, that, that's, that is one of the reasons we have this system in place. Too long have student unions been dominated by the voices who just shout and get involved from the very beginning in, in the politics of that student union and drive that forward. Rather, we want to make sure that it's representative of every student on campus, not just a select few. Thank you. Uh, and, if I could... but, and now I think we should direct yeah. it back on to that. Take it back. Um, ben, I wonder what is your opinion on the argument that BDS is a collective uh, punishment? <laughs> so, nothing to do with students, this is just to do with the yeah. BDS yeah. is a collective punishment. Well, just briefly on that one particular uh, issue or issue or question. Um, just, just on that one particular question about um, the idea that a boycott uh, equals collective punishment, um, a bit of context to sort of give a hopefully more interesting answer for this. Because the Palestinians launched the call for boycott in its current BDS form uh, in 2005, so it's, it's not quite a decade. Uh, and in that period, BDS has seen a large number of successes. A lot of people have been latching onto this as a way to respond to the crimes that Israel is routinely committing. Not just in this country, people have been supporting it in many countries around the world. And the Israeli government itself 
and those who, for whatever reason, support the existence of an apartheid system in Israel, are very worried about the success and the growth of boycott movements. And there are a number of different ways that the Israeli government and Israel lobby groups have been looking to try and fight or undermine Palestine solidarity activists and boycott in general. You can see where I'm going with this from where we started. Now, some of those strategies have included things like, okay, this is like the, the greatest hits, okay? Rebranding in at number five, okay? Rebranding means that instead of thinking about Israel in terms of all those nasty things like war crimes, you think about Israel in terms of nightclubs in Tel Aviv and desert journeys in the Negev, okay? So this is one, this is one thing. Um, <laughs> secondly, another strategy would be to, um, and this is, this only really applies in certain situations, but taking paid propaganda trips for people in positions of influence out to Israel to influence what they're going to say. Another strategy that has been used is so-called lawfare, which is where legal threats are made against entities or institutions that look like they might be considering or actually implement some form of boycott policy, normally based on spurious claims to do with charity commission regulations and all this stuff, because of course for a lot of bodies, Simply, the, simply receiving a letter from lawyers is enough to want to make them not do anything. Another aspect of it is talking about boycott in terms of extremism and why can't we all have dialogue and sort of bit of that. Um, and I think it's probably fair enough to, to, to suggest, maybe it's not the case, but let's suggest that a motion seeking to make boycott uh, equivalent to, or synonymous with, collective punishment, a crime as defined under the Geneva Conventions. One might assume that this is another tactic within the general arsenal of tactics uh, to try and thwart uh, a movement they can't actually be thwarted, but they, but they don't get that. So I have to say that that's probably one of the smarter versions, or one of the smarter efforts. Um, but I would like, obviously, when this motion is discussed or whatever, or if it's discussed, because I've got a bit confused on that one, um, uh, when it's discussed by a computer-generated representation of the campus, I hope, that, um, I hope that people make the point, um, I hope that people make the point that no one would have accused Martin Luther King of committing a war crime against the Montgomery Bus Company when he instituted a boycott and targeted segregation. <laughs> similarly, no one would have done the same thing when boycotting apartheid South Africa. Yeah. So one hopes that even, even a robot manufactured consensus produces a logical version on this idea and it's sort of laughed out of town for being the sort of ludicrous shield, the desperate shield, the increasingly desperate shield of people who want a shield, they want to protect a rogue state from accountability. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah? Yeah. If, um, to Ben, do you advocate for the ethnic cleansing of um, Jewish settlements in across the Green Line, um, which I understand to be an armistice line, but not a state line. Okay, uh, the gentleman behind. Yes. Well, extending <coughs> from the student body to the population of Britain and so forth, I think one of the greatest values of making progress is the understanding of ignorance about Palestinian issues. And I found this with friends of mine who know my interests and ask why, and they just know about office being fired over uh, from Palestine. This moment is a very good example. On the 17th, there was a tragic event in the city where five people were killed. That made headlines of every newspaper. There were over 500 violent incursions in Palestine in that moment. The biggies were US, um, Israel Navy blowing up fishing vessels. <coughs> they were setting fire to crops, and I think there were 300 hospitalized Palestinians and five killed. So, same number in that number. But every day, 
that the mere had 20 to 50 violent injections. They never reached the news. <coughs> what is it that starts the business? Why is this getting the papers of the Romania Guardian and the Independent? Thank you. And the final question <coughs> is, is there one more question in the house? Yeah. Um, basically, I agree with everything that you said, and I've spoken to a few scientists, and they always say the same thing, like, um, oh, who are the Palestinians, the invented race uh, from Arabs, and they say stuff like, um, Israel like, has a right to defend itself from Hamas, who are hiding behind um, human shields, and that's one of the reasons why they um, say the mass killings that to the innocent lives of Palestine are just capital damage. Thank you, Ben. Right. Um, so the first question related to the uh, West Bank settlements, right? So the way you frame the question to do with the Green Line being an armistice line, not the border of the state, it takes us into the realm of international law. And when we go into the realm of international law, the clear consensus is that every single Israeli settlement is illegal. And that's the consensus within the Security Council, the General Assembly, the Red Cross, also interestingly the high contracting parties of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which I mention because uh, this, uh, about two weeks less actually, um, after a request by Mahmoud Abbas in the name of the State of Palestine, um, the high contracting parties, the member states to the Fourth Geneva Convention, which sort of is the body of law we've got for occupied territory, will actually meet in Switzerland, I think it's the 17th of this month, specifically to discuss the situation in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The last time that happened was in 2001, in the early days of the Second Intifada. The Israeli government and the US have done their best to prevent this meeting happening. I wonder why. Why would the Israeli government not be interested in the high contracting parties of the Fourth Geneva Convention meeting in Switzerland late this month to discuss the situation in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. That's because the Israeli government doesn't recognize the applicability of the Fourth Geneva Conventions to the West Bank and Gaza Strip, which is why it says the settlements are not illegal, aside from the fact that they think it's, you know, for some of them, that it's their God-given right to live there. So, when we get into the realm of international law, settlements and those who support them or defend them don't have a leg to stand on. In fact, it's the settlements that have contributed directly to the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in the West Bank who were forced out from their homes, who can no longer make a livelihood because they can't access their farms, who can no longer make a livelihood because they're denied water, which settlers living next to them are using. So ethnic cleansing is happening right now. It's happening right now, not a hypothetical ethnic cleansing in the future. But ethnic cleansing is happening right now, today, by the government of Israel and its armed forces. Secondly, or well, the question that we had about, in, effectively, the question is to do with an imbalance in reporting. If I mean, just to so sort of give us, yeah, I've, yeah, I've just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm actually just ignoring you now because you've already asked two questions. So I'm just moving on to the next one. Okay, feel free to come up and talk to me really briefly. So I'm just going on to the next question now, and the question is about balance in the media. Now, the question about balance in the media is as follows. The routine Israeli violations in the West Bank and Gaza Strip happen every single day and every week. And it means, and this is a perfect example to highlight how there's no balance in the so-called conflict. Excuse me, sorry, could you uh, please just let him talk? Thank you. Just you now. Yeah. All right. So, obviously, you know, it's not a big surprise, it's not a big surprise um, to see sort of confusion about understanding of privilege and voices for someone defending a uh, colonial state. But if we just move on to this next question about balance in the media. So the problem, one of the problems is that Israeli violations are so routine that they lose the newsworthiness that is a factor in like news teams and newsrooms. Okay? So every single night there are Israeli occupation forces breaking down Palestinian doors and taking people out of their beds. And this is one of the, and if you look at the routine nature of Israeli violations, you understand how futile it is to talk about balance. Are the Palestinians breaking in to Israeli homes in Tel Aviv every night, dragging people out of their beds? Are the Palestinian tanks around Israeli communities 
Are there Palestinian, are there is hundreds of Israelis lying in Palestinian dungeons? No. Because it's a colonial conflict. It's a colonial situation where asymmetry and imbalance is intrinsic to the entire framework and situation. Now, why that doesn't get represented in the media is complicated, okay? Now, one of the reasons is because of its routineness. Another reason uh, is things like the way in which um, reporters and the people who are making the news are also just themselves products of uh, a particular societal consensus too, okay? So they will share, uh, it's sort of a, a self-regenerating, um, perpetuating system of assumptions. That's part of it, that's another aspect. Obviously also, um, media organizations know that if they say X, Y, or Z about the situation, that they're gonna, get, they're gonna get attacked by the Israeli embassy and by Israel lobby groups, et cetera, et cetera. There's, this is quite a sort of a big topic in and of itself, okay? And it also relates to um, imbalance problems in the media more generally, because that is reflected in a wide number of issues, um, not just exclusively on Palestine. Uh, and I'll just take, okay, from this last question, which is to do with human shields, I just want to highlight that one aspect of your question, okay? So, when the brave Israeli Air Force was bombing Palestinian children to pieces over the summer, some people had the temerity to suggest that Palestinians are their own victims because they've served as quote unquote human shields. Now, apart from the disgusting callousness of this approach, there is an important legal point to be made here, and this is not discussed often. The Israeli military has, believe it or not, an international law department within the army. And they have a team of lawyers that advise generals and senior officials about what they can or can't do with regards to uh, attacks. Now, when it comes to this issue, uh, after Operation, Defend uh, Operation uh, Cast Lead in January 2009, there was a very interesting article in Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, that went into detail about some of the legal rationale that the Israeli military uses. Now, get this. The Israeli military rationale when it comes to human shields is the following. If you issue a warning to a house or a particular area that an attack is imminent in that area, after you've issued that warning, the civilians present lose their protected status under international law from the Israeli military's point of view. In other words, once you've issued that warning, you can kill them and they're not a civilian under international law from the Israeli military's point of view. Okay? This is their own rationale for doing it. So in other words, you can be in a house and if for some reason you ignore the warning or you're too slow to get out of your house because you've been given 40 seconds to decide which relative you're going to pick up and which possession you're going to take before your entire property is blown to kingdom come. If you're too slow and you're wiped out, then you're not counted, from the Israeli military's point of view, as a civilian. You're counted as a voluntary human shield, okay? because you haven't obeyed the warning that's been given. So in fact, although the Israeli military and its propagandists trumpet this idea of the warning as being some sort of unparalleled humanitarian gesture in the history of modern warfare, it in fact is yet one more sick example of an occupying army that will twist and distort international law to perpetuate yet another massacre. So it's a good example, not of sort of, you know, what they think it is, but actually it's another way of illustrating just how messed up the whole Israeli military's approach is to these sorts of operations. I'd like it if um, we could all give a big round of applause.